We're delighted that you made it this evening, despite the heat. Um, and I would like to start by telling you a little bit about JDC Archives, as some of you might be new to our programs. Um, the JDC Archives holds the records of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee since its creation 103 years ago. Um, as a result, we are one of the most important repositories um, for modern Jewish history. Um, visiting scholars from around the world, as well as filmmakers, journalists, family researchers, curators, use our records for their research. I encourage you to um, look at our website, uh, www.jdc.org. Um, we have wonderful exhibits. Um, we also have a name database that you can uh, look up. And uh, we also have text collections that you can search. I um, also would like to tell you a little bit more about um, the fellowship and about Ellen Lewis. Um, Ellen Lewis was a German Jewish refugee who fled to Shanghai in 1939. Um, and while in Shanghai, she was helped by GDC. Um, she worked for JDC while in Shanghai. She continued to work for JDC when she came back to the United States. And um, she left a very significant um, bequest to JDC, and she earmarked a portion for JDC archives. In tribute to Ellen Lewis, the JDC archives initiated this fellowship in 2012 to enable scholars to conduct research in our archives. Uh, we felt that this was a fitting tribute to Ellen Lewis. Thank you, Isabel, for this very generous introduction and in general for the warm welcome that you've given me here at JDC. In general, also, I'd like to extend my thanks to all the JDC's employees and especially those who have made my stay so far here a very pleasant experience. Uh, and also, of course, thanks to the JDC for the fellowship that has enabled me to come here in the first place. So let us begin. The Second World War ended in 1945. Well, so far nothing new, you'll probably say. Indeed, but however, despite the significance of this historical moment, the official end of hostilities did, did not mean the immediate beginning of a new era, a turning of the page for better or for worse to reconstruction, human rights, but also to the onset of what would soon be termed the Cold War. For clarity's sake, say, we are generally taught to think in terms of such linear watershed moments of before and after, of endings and beginnings. Needless to say, reality is a whole lot messier. During the summer and fall of 1945, millions of uprooted Europeans made their way home across the European continent. The remaining refugees crowded together in numerous displaced persons or DP camps in Germany, Austria, and Italy. A substantial number of these refugees were Jews. In this lecture, I would like to introduce two lesser-known actors on what I call the fringe of the Jewish DP story. On the one hand, this will be, uh, I will be dealing with the Jews that were politically active on the DP scene in Austria, represented on this slide by the picture you see on the left. And on the other hand, I'd also like to deal with the American Jewish scholar Koppel S. Pinson, whom you see on the right. First, I will share with you some preliminary observations on the political activities of the Jewish DPs in Austria, as well as on the larger politics surrounding the Austrian Jewish DP question. In this unique Austrian context, which is generally underrepresented in the existing scholarship, I ask the question, to which extent did the Jewish DPs directly and indirectly influence the development of migration and refugees policies, discourses, and ideology during the post-Second World War period? The second somewhat shorter part of this talk, I will shift the attention to one remarkable, albeit forgotten figure in the larger story of Jew Jewish DP relief work, Koppel S. Pinson. 
Pinson shortly served as Director of Education and Culture for the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee for Jewish Displaced Persons in Germany and Austria. He was also a very well-known scholar of German history, and he formed part in the late 1940s and 1950s of the burgeoning field of nationalism studies in North America. Pinson's activities connect Jewish history after 1945 to the larger history of post-war European recon reconstruction in a transnational context. Now, before we delve into the details, I would like to start off with a classic disclaimer. What I'm presenting today is very early stage research, and the project is indeed so fresh that it could be best compared to a meal for which most of the shopping still needs to be done, which is in fact what I'm doing here during these weeks at the JDC archives. Um, I will try to make this uncooked state up to you by laying out as compellingly as I can what I do already know about the general situation of the Jewish DPs in Austria, as well as about their political activities, and even more so why I think this topic deserves special attention. After that, I will try to segue into the somewhat related and at the same time also quite separate story of Koppel Pinson, who is another fringe figure in Jewish history, who, and I hope you will eventually partly agree with me, was a fascinating actor on the Jewish stage. And I duly admit that bringing together these two stories in one lecture is in fact the result of somewhat of a coincidence represented by me, the scholar. But I hope you will still bear with me as I think the exercise of synthesis that I am attempting here can prove fruitful and can lead us to new insights. After all, both stories demonstrate how fringe histories can serve as what I would call connectors, bringing together seemingly unconnected spheres, realms or events, and therewith offering new perspectives on the immediate post-World War II period. I am sure many of you in this room are somewhat familiar with the general history of displaced persons, but still I would like to go through some of the basic um, details about this history, uh, which lasted from 1943, when the first provisions for the expected post-war refugee crisis were made by the Allies, and it lasted from 43, surprisingly long, until 1957, when the last DP camp, Fürnwald in Germany, was closed. The camps in Germany and to a lesser but still important extent Austria and Italy became important political breeding grounds for Jews and non-Jews alike. International Jewish organizations in the camps and surrounding the camps lobbied for Jewish DPs to migrate to Palestine, to the US or elsewhere. And to achieve this aim of migration, Jewish political actors forged connections with non-Jewish policymakers responsible for the formulation of the new population politics. Jewish organizations, which in part represented the Jewish DPs, also obtained a voice in the discussions leading up to the construction of the post-war refugee regime, with which we still deal today, especially in the US and in the newly formed at the time United Nations. And this is, for instance, shown by the very strong and influential Jewish presence at the 1945 San Francisco conference. Now, on a lower level, in the DP camps themselves, Jews organized a plethora of political parties representing the different political ambitions that existed amongst the Jewish DPs. Because of this highly politicized context, combined with the DP's growing international visibility, they came to co-determine the issues on the agenda of larger refugee debates that were being waged at the time. With the Jewish DPs in mind, policymakers now focused more on what they called population redistribution rather than a right of return. After all, most of these DPs, especially the Jewish ones, had no countries to return to. This fact um, held and furthered the Zionists' cause of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine, but at the same time it also led to the US adopting the 1948 DP Act, enabling certain categories of DPs to immigrate to the US, but in fact actually limiting that immigration. 
In the same vein, the International Refugee Organization, or IRO, which was called into existence in the first place to address the lingering DP presence, became mainly engaged with population movements and resettlement, rather than with returning DPs to their original homes. Now, from the large context to the specifics, why a focus on Austria? Well, in the existing scholarship on displaced persons, the Austrian story has often been conflated with the whole history of Jewish DPs mostly in Germany, mostly treated as a footnote to the German story. Well, I would like to make the case that Austrian DP history deserves attention in its own right because of several unique features that I believe set it apart from the German case. First of all, much more than in Germany and Italy, Austria was positioned on one of the geographical and ideological borders within the burgeoning Cold War theater. So one of the questions that I would like to address is how Austria's position on the geographical and political border between East and West played out in connection to the Jewish DP question. Policymakers who needed to assess the refugees and their future in these years between 1943 and 1957 were influenced by increasingly perceived Cold War threats. So what role did such anxieties play in the minds of contemporary intellectuals, military and relief workers? In the Austrian DP camps, much more so than in those in Germany, the Marxist-inspired Jewish labor bond, as well as the territorialist Freedom League, became important political forces alongside the Zionists. The leaders of these parties often had earned their political stripes and were also originating from Eastern European circles that were now considered to be suspicious in the West at best. So how were such political identities negotiated and received by the Jewish and the non-Jewish organizations in charge in the camps? And how was this different in Austria from the situation in Germany and Italy? A second reason why I think Austria is a, is a particular story that deserves, deserves attention in its own right is the fact that the most popular transit route of illegal immigrants to Palestine ran through Austria. This meant that DP communities in that country became unavoidably involved with the so-called Bricha, or flight movement, which worked illegally to bring European Jews to Palestine through Austria. And this involvement made Austria, rendered Austria of great political importance to the Allied powers. Also, and this is of a, on a very different note, but not coincidentally, both Germany and Austria have in the past years again been amongst the countries most affected by the influx of contemporary refugees. By revisiting the past in light of the present and vice versa, in my larger project, I would like to demonstrate to what extent Europe has been in a similar situation before, but also how these past experiences helped shape both Jewish political ideology and action and broader political ideas and practices. I also argue that telling the largely untold story of Jewish DP politics in Austria broadens our understanding of Jewish political history during the years preceding and directly following the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. And then finally, a last reason for focusing on Austria, on the more micro or individual level of the G Jewish DPs themselves, there were several important differences with the German situation. For one, the national, religious, and cultural backgrounds of the Jewish DPs in the Austrian camps differed significantly from those of their counterparts in Germany. The German DPs originated overwhelmingly from Poland. By contrast, the Austrians, I may call them that, mainly stemmed from Hungary and Romania, areas where pre-war Jewish politics had been entirely different and generally far less Zionism dominated than in Poland. And these differences in the post-war period made for a distinct Jewish political landscape in the Austrian DP setting. As the historian Thomas Albrecht wrote, and I will quote him directly because he's one of the authorities on the history of DPs in Austria, and he also um, formulated it very clearly. So he wrote, 
Looking at Austria, there are at least some doubts as to the general Zionist outlook of most of the survivors. The horrors of the Holocaust did not create a common Jewish identity per se, and Jewish survivors were not a homogenous group. There were important differences in cultural background, past experiences, and future outlook. For instance, the so-called Jewish territorialists, to which I will return shortly, were largely absent in Germany, but they gained a substantial following in the Austrian camps. I won't bore you with too many numbers, but just to give you an idea of the scope of the, the, the problem, the, the issue that we're talking about, and also to put in, into perspective of the larger DP um, question, a few numbers on Austria. So as you can see, in the summer of 1945, there were a total of 16,000 Jews in Austria. Many had come through, but also many used Austria as a gateway to get into other countries, including Germany, but there were 16,000 in the summer of 45. And the number decreased somewhat towards the end of the year, but then in the summer of 47, which was officially after the closing date of when people uh, received the label the DP, there was a large influx of new Jewish uh, refugees, mostly from Romania. Um, 30,000 in the summer of 1947. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, 30,000 of a total of 650,000 DPs in all the three countries combined, about a quarter of a million of whom were Jewish. So 30,000 out of 250,000 were in Austria at that point. <coughs> then there is a slow decrease, um, as you see, May 1948, 24,000, of a total of 190,000 Jewish DPs at that point. And then again, in 1949, there is a new influx of refugees, in, at this point, the Hungarians. So you see an up and down of numbers. Well, these numbers are based mostly on the research of other scholars, uh, and different scholars name different numbers, but I try to find kind of the middle way. Uh, so these are largely estimates, but I think they give a good reflection of it all. And then you see by early 1950s, the numbers are small, um, but there is this last remnant of people that stays, mostly people dealing with uh, medical issues that do not uh, allow for them to be accepted to emigrate to Palestine or the US. Uh, in general, one, could assume that a total of about 220,000 to 250,000 Jewish uh, refugees passed through Austria at some point, some of them staying for a brief period of time, but several tens of thousands um, lingering in the Austrian DP camps for a longer, longer period of time. So only a maximum of 10% of all DPs in Austria at any time were Jews. Um, here are some numbers if, if you're interested to know how many camps there were. Uh, camps could be as small as a building up to like a proper camp as we uh, understand them. Um, there were probably about 12 camps that you could really consider large um, camps in the whole of Austria. But then there were also the Rothschild Hospital, for instance, in Vienna, which would not answer to this classical idea of what a camp would look like. Um, and then as for their Zionist inclinations, also this wavered throughout time. There were different polls held. So in, in the summer of 1945, the vast majority, but still only, I would say, 70% of the questioned DPs expressed their wish to go to Palestine. 30% always wanted to go uh, somewhere else. And then as history proceeds, uh, by August 1949, it's only 30%. And this should also be understood in the light of military challenges that uh, the young state of Israel is, is faced with at the time and concerns about the security in the new state. Um, but this is just to show that there were very different ideas about where their future should take place amongst different DPs all throughout the period that we're talking about. Now, let me take you on a little trip to an earlier research project of mine. Um, for one, because I really like to talk about it, but also because it will enable me to share with you how I arrived at the current project. And it will also allow me to add some flesh to the bone of the story of politics amongst Jewish DPs in Austria. 
Um, most importantly, though, I think it will help to illustrate in which way I think these politics were more diverse and less Zionism dominated than in Germany, even though also in Germany it is questionable whether everyone was really a Zionist or that this served a different purpose. Different scholars have also scrutinized this question for the German case, but I will now focus on Austria. So I first started thinking about Jewish DP politics in Austria via my doctoral project on the Jewish territorialist movement. The main territorialist aim was the pragmatic search for places of Jewish settlement outside both Europe and Palestine. The movement was first organized between 1905 and 1925 as the Jewish Territorialist Organization, or ITO, under the leadership of, you may know the name, Israel Zangwill, who was an Anglo-Jewish author, but at the same time also Zionist and later Territorialist leader. Um, here you see a picture that was taken in 1905 at the 7th Zionist Congress, uh, where the split between the Zionists and the Territorialists actually occurred. So all these people were present at the Zionist conference, left the room, started their own organization, and took this group picture. Um, after 1925, the movement was disbanded for about a decade and was then reinstated as the so-called Freeland League for Jewish Territorial Colonization, more or less in 1934, as a reaction to growing um, anti-Semitism and persecution of Jews in Europe. Between 1946 and 1948, the now New York-based Freedom League tried to settle a group of 30,000 Eastern European Jewish DPs in the Dutch colony of Suriname. The DP Freedom League attracted a membership of several thousand DPs in the different camps, and it was almost exclusively active in Austria. The movement's leadership seems to have been mostly Jewish-Hungarian and Jewish-Romanian, which again reflects the specific demographics of the Austrian DP camps. In July 1947, Yitzhak Kaczerginski, who was a DP in the Austrian camp of Steyr, stumbled across a, co a copy of the Freedom League's periodical in Yiddish, often Spell, which means on the threshold. And this issue contained an article about the Suriname scheme. Inspired by the idea, Kaczerginski formed his own Freedom League group, which was soon followed by similar groups in other camps. By December 47, Kaczerginski reported the existence of groups in eight different camps, with a total of over 500 members. 200 DPs in Shire alone had noted down Suriname as their wish for destination on an international refugee organization questionnaire. There were these questionnaires going around asking people where do you want to go, and 200 people had written down Suriname. Even though the project was very preliminary and nothing had actually been uh, accomplished. By late 1948, in the German and Austrian camps, some 3,000 people had openly expressed their wish to emigrate under a territorialist scheme, and most preferably to Suriname. And this is a letter I found here in the JDC archives of Kaczorkinski to a JDC uh, representative asking for support, um, presenting a uh, uh, the minutes of a meeting of a group of DPs who uh, self-defined house territory is wanting to go to Suriname. There were different expressions of this wish. For instance, in April 1948, one DP leader in Germany said to a JBC representative, take us to Madagascar until you can take us to some other place. Madagascar was also one of the um, destinations explored by the territorialists. Um, also in 1948, another Polish territorialist defended a collective move to what was generally in the press presented as a wild or fantastical scheme in Suriname. And this territorialist said that he would have preferred to see his family survive in the so-called uncivilized world, rather, and I quote him now, rather than among highly civilized nations and under the technologically flawless Gestapo machine. Another territorialist added, we are sick of the civilized nations. So there was a lot of allure coming from these tropical plants that the Freedom League was exploring. In May 1948, 
The Freedom League was said to be one of the biggest Jewish organizations among the DPs in Austria. And that same month, just a few days before the proclamation of the State of Israel, 166 members of the Freeland Group in Vienna sent a letter to Herbert Lehman, who was the former governor of New York and a later senator, and he was also a former director general of the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, or UNRWA, uh, responsible for the civilian side of the managing of the DP camps. So these 166 DPs asked Leon to acknowledge the wish of certain DPs not to emigrate to either Palestine or the US, but to shape their future within a territorialist scheme. They wrote very dramatically, why, when a ray of hope does appear for these unfortunate brethren, is it overlooked by everyone? Well, the Zionists um, tried their best to exclude territorialism and other political factions, for that matter, from the political life and the camps. Suspicions arose amongst uh, non-Zionists that potential brainwashing of the DPs was performed by Zionist propagandists, known as shlichim, sent to the camps from Palestine to motivate people to emigrate to Palestine. The Zionist kibbutzim, which were also uh, training camps that were established throughout Austria, were seen by these non-Zionists as hotbeds of indoctrination. Under the guise of combating factionalism and speeding up the process of terminating the camps, non-mainstream Zionist or entirely non-Zionist activities were discouraged or counteracted. Only in March 1948, did the joint reorganize its relief operations to prevent preferential treatment of certain committees, in other words, Zionist committees. Nonetheless, as of 1948, young Jews who refused to join the military forces organized by the Haganah were taken off joint Russian lists. And in a similar vein, by the fall of 1950s, so or pretty late, in the US zone in Austria, the US army authorities helped to increase pressure on Jewish DPs to move to Israel by denying aid to those who did not comply. Members of the Jewish Labour Bund, also just known as the Bund, reported mistreatment by Zionists as well. Such discrimination was reported in Camp Buch, which was close to Hallein, where Bund leaders complained that they received less food and clothing, and they therefore asked for a separate Bundist camp, which they, of course, never got. And in another camp, a sick Bundist was denied milk. The JDC archives, again, holds a file with 22 documents dealing with such discrimination against Bund members and the Austrian DP camps. And just to give you an idea, these are four examples from this file. In a similar vein, reports reached the Freedom League's headquarters in New York that non-Zionists were denied food and work packages sent by the joint, uh, work and food packages that were sent to the camps by the joint. And apparently Zionists also physically intimidated DPs who were openly interested in the Suriname project. Kaczorkinski, whom we met before, wrote to headquarters in New York that his movement has consciously refrained from any open registration for DPs who were willing to go to Suriname out of fear of repercussions. Nevertheless, the Zionists wanted the DP Freedom League to be disbanded altogether. According to Kaczykinski, he had been fired from his post as director of the camp registration, and he also expected that similar measures would soon be applied to freelanders in other camps as well. Discrimination also happened not purely on political grounds, but along national lines, which in a way masqueraded political considerations as well. For instance, by the Brichat, by the illegal uh, immigration movement against Romanians, in 1947, probably because these people were not Zionists. 70% of the DP newcomers, as we also saw on the earlier slide, in 1947 were Romanians. The Zionist Bricha was de facto in charge of the Austrian camps at that point, and they considered the mostly non-Zionist Romanians as economic refugees and therefore not eligible to receive care. So for several months, the only help that these people received was from the joint. That should be mentioned as well. So I 
the Liberator mentioned all these instances of alleged Zionist discrimination, not to discredit the important work that the different Zionist organizations did in the numerous DP camps, and it was very important work. But I mentioned this to demonstrate that objections were raised against the treatment of non-Zionists, which in fact proves that such non-Zionist activities happened in the first place. A final indication that non-Zionist political activities in the camps happened and that they were considered of importance and even as a threat is the fact that external bodies also acknowledged these activities and in some instances even supported them. For instance, in 1948, the preparatory commission uh, for the IRRO, the PCIRO, stated its intention to establish a five million US dollar fund for large scale settlements by selected groups of DPs in what they called undeveloped areas that were not Palestine. The IRO specifically offered to support the Freedom League in its endeavors in Suriname. Now, let's zoom out for a bit again from the Austrian story to the larger story of Jewish politics in the European DB camps. So in the German case, and in German scholarship on the German case, the dominant narrative is still that the overwhelming majority of Jewish DPs chose the Zionist path either because of a lack of viable alternatives, but mainly based on an almost universal Zionist zeal strengthened by the recent experiences of the Shoah. As one very eminent scholar has um, uh, put it, and I, I will quote her, whatever the political convictions of Nazi victims had been in life, in death they were Zionists. While DPs protested any attempt to appropriate the dead for a particular political party, there was tacit agreement that the dead supported the movement of the survivors to the land of Israel. And since dead people do not speak, it is easy for the living to put words in their mouths. In later accounts of the period, all Jewish DPs were considered to be part of the same group, the She'eli Hapleta, the surviving remnant of European Jewry that actively contributed to the founding of the Jewish state. This is not untrue, but it is painting too limited a picture. Without denying the importance of Jewish DPs in the Zionist imaginary, it must also be acknowledged that non-Zionist political life in the camps was not all marginal or non-belonging, as it has been put. The Bund, the Orthodox Mizrahi and Agudat Israel movements, non-Zionist socialist parties, as well as the Freedom League, also existed in the political spectrum of the DP camps. After the departure of Zionist emissaries and the arrival of more religious uh, refugees during the late 1940s, the influence of religious parties grew, mostly of Mizrahi, Abuda, and the rescue organization Ba'ad Ha'ad Salah. Left Zionist and communist forces were also active and even dominated some of the lager or camp committees. Again, I mention all these non-Zionist parties and organizations, first and foremost, to show the diversity of Jewish political life in all DP camps where Jews resided, and in particular in Austria. And I hope that in this way I have at least partially convinced you that looking at Jewish-Austrian DP politics is both fascinating and also scholarly valuable. So now on to... Uh, a short intermezzo where I would love to share with you a collection of pictures that, thanks to the help of um, the JDC um, context here and also the individual JDC employees, I, I've managed to dig up from the archives just to give you an impression of what this Jewish DP life in, life in Austria actually looked like. So just a slideshow. Here we see a group of male DPs in um, camp in uh, St. Marion in Austria, 1946. This is the picture that was also part of the opening slide, which I think best supports the story that I'd like to share with you today. Here we see a group of young Zionists, but left uh, social Zionists, meeting in a room with large drawings on, from left to right of Lenin, Berbohochow, and Herzl. This was in Koben's camp, also in Austria. Here are a few US officials in conversation with representatives of 
the DPs, Jewish DPs, who and they're preparing to move, move into new apartments in the Bindel Michal camp. Uh, this was, in fact, uh, originally built for workers in the Hermann Goering factory, and then they appropriated it to house uh, Jewish DPs. And here they are waiting to move into the same uh, apartments. A truck carrying their possessions, moving into the Binomichel project. And here uh, you see former SS men constructing the temporary community kitchen uh, also at the Binary Hill Apartments. This, I would say, is kind of a typical view of how we imagine the DP camp to have looked like. This was the central area in uh, the DP camp of uh, Beit Bialik, which was just outside of Salzburg, and it housed about 2,000 DPs at its maximum capacity. Here, an idea of how the inside looked like also in Salzburg, 1947. And here what I think is a very theatrical, almost staged view um, of the fire escape at the Rothschild Hospital in Vienna. Very beautiful image, I think. And then there is this whole set of pictures that you find in the archives, you may also be familiar with them. This is actually a famous picture, I've seen it in several uh, publications. So what is being done in terms of constructive work in the camp, so education is very important. So this is a, uh, uh, yeah, a typical image of children in school. Here, a boy learning English in Halein. It's the early 1950s, I found, but that may have been coincidental that a lot of these educational pictures stem from a slightly later era when people really settled down and educational facilities were set up. Uh, so this picture is dated, at least in the archive, to 1950. And here to show that it wasn't just the secular uh, Jew that lived in these camps, but there were also large uh, religious factions, and here you see a religious school situation in Halein, also from the early 1950s. Well, constructive work happens by people of all backgrounds and genders, and this is probably a very a picture used for promotional activities of women knitting outdoors. Unclear in which camp exactly. Oh no, this is in Steyr. And then, of course, the matzo baking. <laughs> so these are pictures of people that um, would be very much welcomed in the, the, the Zionist Palestinian imaginary, it was really imaginary, uh, of constructive workers. But then, by contrast, if you look at the pictures, the whole picture set, then you find a variety of people that may not necessarily answer to this image. Uh, but who were also there. And then finally, the departure. This is said to be the first ship carrying Jewish DPs out of Salzburg for immigration to the US in this case. So probably 1945, 1946. And now for something completely different. Or is it Koppel Pinson? I would like to propose that both the Jewish DPs in Austria and Pinson serve a similar purpose, at least in this lecture, uh, and that is to demonstrate how, uh -huh, how seemingly less important historical actors can shed light on much larger processes or on on unknown connections or hitherto unknown connections between people, organizations, fields, schemes, realms, connectors, in other words. Well, some words on Pinson, and it will follow the form of a sort of resume, and it serves as an epilogue to this talk, but hopefully for me personally as a prologue to future research that I hope to conduct. Pinson was born to a Jewish family in Pastavi, or in Polish uh, Pastavi, in current day Belarus. But he arrived in the United States in 1907 when he was only three years old. He obtained a university degree from Graz College in Philadelphia in 1927 and then his PhD from Columbia University in 1934. 
And Pinson was at the forefront of the development of the discipline of nationalism studies in the 1930s and 1940s, alongside scholarly giants like Hans Kohn and Carlton Hayes, who served as his doctoral advisor. Despite his prolific scholarly activities, Pinson's academic career advanced quite slowly, and only in 1951 was he promoted to the rank of full professor at Queen's College, which he joined uh, at the college's um, foundation in 1937. Despite the slow progression of his career, throughout these years, Pinson produced several monographs on German history and German nationalist history that were considered masterpieces by his scholarly contemporaries. Pinson's career and the, so far at least, I found very limited archival material that he left behind, offer an insight into the development of the field of nationalism studies in the wake of the Second World War. He was also active in the field of Jewish studies and he served as one of the founders of Jewish social studies, as some of you may know, one of the foremost scholarly journals in the field until this day. Pioneering Jewish studies scholars like Salo Baron and Benzion Dinu, two founding fathers of the field of Jewish studies, were involved with several of Pinson's publications, and Baron even eulogized Pinson after his death in 1961. Years after leaving both the Zionist political sphere and Jewish studies behind, Hans Kohn considered Pinson one of his few connections with his own days as a Jewish scholar. So there we have Pinson acting as an individual connector between Kohn and his own Zionist and scholarly past. It might also have been Kohn, in fact, who introduced Pinson to the field of Jewish uh, studies and made him more interested in non-Zionist political history than the Zionist mainstream. And in that context, Pinson published one of the few until today, existing collections of the writings of diaspora nationalist thinker Shimon Dubnov in English, and he wrote extensively on both the Jewish labor bond and the heterodox Jewish political thinker Nathan Birnbaum, who coined the term Zionism in the 1890s. Pinson corresponded with Robert Welch, who was a famous German Zionist newspaper publicist, and his interest in non-Zionist political options may have been also partly fed by Pinson's own recent experiences as the JDC's Director of Education and Culture for the Jewish GPs in Germany and Austria, which was a function he fulfilled in 1945 and 46. Uh, it's mostly related to this period that I'm currently excavating documents here at the JDC, very interesting. So finally, if we try to dissect the extent to which Pinson can figure as what I propose he is, a historical connector, his correspondence reveals even more diverse prominent liaisons. And I'll do a bit of name dropping here, because flipping through these letters, I turned up prominent names, including author Thomas Mann, political scientist Waldemar Gurian, German historian Friedrich Meinecke, New School director Alvin Johnson, and American politician Sander Wells, as well as several important in the 1950s Italian Republican thinkers first and foremost, uh, Benedetto Croce. So I've got a few more pictures for you because it's so much fun and I was very happily surprised to find them here. So um, these are a few pictures of Pinson in his capacity as the JDC's uh, educational director. So here we have him uh, with several of his collaborators in Germany, where he mostly spent time at the Offenbach uh, uh, depot, uh, where he was one of several figures trying to recover um, the cultural heritage of the European Jews and, and, and transporting them. He, he, his agenda was to save material, bring it to the US. His somewhat rival, but also collaborator, uh, Gershom Sholom of the Hebrew University tried to do the same, but bring materials to uh, Jerusalem. So a lot was going on, and I know that several scholars are dealing with that. It's an interesting moment in time of kind of infighting, cultural and political infighting in the Jewish intellectual sphere. So here he is with uh, some of his colleagues. Um, here he is at the Lampertheim DP camp, probably on an inspection tour. Here again at the Offenbach Archival Depot. 
and here posing with a group of refugees uh, from a kibbutz, in fact, close to Zylsheim uh, camp in Bavaria. <coughs> So, to conclude, what do we take away from all of this beyond the conclusion that this nowadays mostly forgotten American Jewish scholar was well connected in his own days? Well, for one, I claim that Pinson was not only connected to a wide range of people, but that he himself helped us to make unprecedented connections between the field of nationalism studies and Jewish studies, American Jewish politics, and uh, geopolitical debates and discourses. Another proposal that I'd like to make is that taking Pinson as a point of departure to study this wide and admittedly somewhat loose network of actors offers novel perspectives on the often complicated position he himself and also this whole group of scholars and intellectuals held on the spectrum between communism and anti-communism, black and white. Reality was much more complicated. This bifurcation polarized the political and intellectual communities of the day, but in reality, people were not so easily placed on this spectrum. In the case of Pinson, this complex position towards different political systems was also partly based on his own real-life experiences in Germany, where he spent some time in the early 1930s when he was working on his PhD and doing research there, and then again in 1945-46 in a very different Germany when he served as the JPC's uh, educational director. Pinson's role in Germany and to a lesser extent in Austria brings us back, and I do realize in a somewhat creative way, to the Austrian DPs which, with which we started today's exploration, especially through the challenge that his biography poses to our very strict understanding of Cold War divisions. While Pinson co-created the field of nationalism studies in the 1940s, Jewish DPs helped shape post-war population politics during the same period. Even if few policymakers today are aware of it, the discourses, paradigms, and institutions that these politics produced at the time lay at the basis of the development of current day approaches to the ongoing refugee crisis that Europe, and to an extent, the US is faced with. So rather than talking about these issues in general terms, I believe there is added value in focusing on the specificities of local conditions in specific historical moments and in specific geographical regions. In this case, the political activities of Jewish DPs in Austria. And finally, it is my hope that this project can help to further open up migration debates to new avenues, thinking also about the historical context, and by painting a fuller picture of a past that shaped the present. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, when you showed the numbers of DP camps in Austria, um, the ones in the US vastly outnumbered the ones in the UK zone and the French zone. I'm wondering, why is that? Um, well, I, it, sorry. <laughs> It has to do uh, with the fact that the U.S. zone was mostly Upper Austria, and this was also where most former um, Nazi camps had been, and many of these camps were reappropriated to then double or get a new life as DP camps. Uh, some of them for a very brief period, but others longer. And this happened to be also the zone that became the U.S. zone. It was not fully coincidental because U.S. being kind of the strongest ally at that point. Um, uh, but in, in a way, it's a ge geographical coincidence that made that most of these camps ended up being in the, in the U.S. zone. Also, and this is more of a preliminary conclusion based on the research I've done, it seems that the French, the British, I cannot say, but I've seen some French uh, documentation, were very eager to get rid of DPs, uh, didn't really invest. The conditions in, in the French DP camps were much worse than in the US zone. So also individual DPs didn't want to stay there. So if they could, they moved on to the US zone where there was just a better infrastructure and institutions like the joint were present from the very beginning offering, at least for the Jewish segment of the DPs, very good help and uh, support. I'm wondering what do you think of the Austrians um, in, in terms of their, uh, okay, what, what I'm really getting at is 
the Austrians uh, supposedly were uh, kind and, and, and perhaps a little more uh, generous uh, in giving to the people who were in their camps than uh, the Germans or the French. Uh, but uh, that may have been true, uh, but uh, it also seems to me that uh, they were uh, very reluctant to uh, acknowledge their own um, uh, participation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and uh, as far as I know from my personal reading, uh, that uh, it wasn't until many, many years later that they, in fact, uh, you know, admitted to their own guilt and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering you know to what extent you can uh, uh, give us some, some input on that mm. well thank you that allows me to underline um, the fact that despite the fact that these camps were on what we consider Austrian soil, until 1955 there was no Austria in, in, in the statehood sense of the word. So these camps were not at all under any kind of Austrian jurisdiction. So the fact that they were in Austria doesn't mean much apart from the things that are outlined about geographical significance in a Cold War setting, but they were under Allied control. Um, so that doesn't mean that on a daily basis DPs didn't in some way or another engage with people living close by. Um, and as far as I can tell, based on secondary sources and some of the primary stuff that I've seen, those relationships weren't, weren't always great. And they were just as bad, actually, as in the German case. Um, and Austrians, in a way, because this notion of them being victims rather than perpetrators already began in 1945. Uh, and this notion has been generally attacked, and it's called the, the myth of the Second Republic, right? The notion that Austrians were not in any way collaborators, and I think even in Austria today, it is generally accepted that that is, that is a false assumption. So, but at the time, this was a generally held feeling, and that created a lot of resentment amongst Austrians because DPs got higher rations, more food uh, than Austrian citizens who uh, lived in poverty because the country was wrecked by the war. Um, and that led to a lot of conflicts between DPs and Austrians. So um, I don't think it's fully correct to say that Austrians were considered to be kinder or easier going than Germans in that sense. It was also a context of a former Nazi universe in which these camps existed. So there, Austria and Germany are very comparable, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. It was really fascinating, uh, the story. I'm interested to hear about your hypothesis, how this passed analysis of the specific context is influencing the present debates on refugee and migrants. And do you have any hypothesis on what is happening today and how you could illustrate it from your, from your stories? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, which is a question to me, and I think also a question in more general sense. So I, I while developing the idea for this project, I've also been talking to a lot of colleagues and friends, people working in very different fields, not necessarily academics. And I've just come to realize, especially at the height of the recent refugee crisis, and at the same time looking at this history of the late 1940s, how many, first of all, practical parallels there are between then and now, in the sense that many of the refugees that arrived uh, three, four years ago uh, initially ended up in the same geographical areas, a lot in Bavaria, in the south of Germany. So there, I thought, wow, that's so interesting, and I never saw any reflection on that. What does that mean also for, for a place, a location, an actual geographical uh, locale? Um, and then also speaking to my colleagues, uh, people working on, for instance, human rights, especially lawyers, 
have no knowledge in a more general sense of the origins of the discourse of the words that they use the notion of focusing on human rights rather than on group rights for instance is something that was really born in this moment in time um, so my question is not necessarily a question i can answer now but i think it's a question that i would like to repeat especially in dialogues with people from very different walks of life and different also scholarly backgrounds is to ask um, what what is this trajectory how, how did it develop is, is there anything we can learn from looking at how discourses were born what also the rationale and incentives behind the use of certain language in international law in human rights and refugee issues in migration issues um, what are the underlying ideas? Who were the actors who actually coined it? And what, why, for what reason? And does that matter? Does, it, does a term carry the weight of its fathers or mothers? Or is it a self-standing thing? So it's, it's more of a theoretical reflection and exploration. But I do think it might actually have practical implications as well if we know why we choose to focus on individual human rights rather than group rights, for instance, and what implication does it have for the demographic makeup of refugees today as compared to then. And also the growing xenophobia in, in, in the world we live in. How is it paralleled in the 1940s and 50s? How was it worse? How was it better? Um, how was it dealt with then? How can policymakers deal with it now, referring to a past or pointing at a past? So a lot of questions in the reply to your question, but hopefully it's somewhat a stimulus for further thought. <laughs>